Let's look at some animations that will explain to you how the relationships in special relativity come about. The site is called classicalmatter.org and we'll select uh, underwater relativity. Okay, so the basic idea behind these animations is that if you make all your measurements using waves, then the relationship between measurements by different observers will be the same as what we find in special relativity. Okay, so let's start with the first one. Look at what's called time dilation. Okay, and here we see two uh, sort of funny looking submarines and each one has a little clock that counts time by propagating a sound wave or sonar wave back and forth between two transducers. So every time the wave propagates across and then back down, uh, that gives one tick on the clock. All right, and the moving submarine is moving at a speed of 0.866 times the wave speed, which here we call C. And that means that the gamma factor of special relativity, which is the relationship between the, the wave speed and then the, the clock speed here, basically, is equal to 2. Okay, so what that means, here let's play it again, is that as the moving submarine propagates, the wave has to travel farther between each tick of the clock. Okay, and it travels farther by this gamma factor, this factor of 2. Uh, the hypotenuse here is twice as long as this short side, which is the direction of the stationary clock. Okay, so if we look at the measured time, uh, the stationary clock has made four ticks, whereas the moving clock has only made two ticks. Okay, and that's of course a factor of one over gamma for the uh, moving time. Okay, so clearly we see that a moving clock will tick slower than a stationary clock if in fact the clock makes its measurements using waves. Okay, and that's called time dilation. Now in special relativity it turns out that while we can see relative motion between two observers, it's impossible to say that one is stationary and the other one's moving. Generally any observer thinks of themselves as being stationary and they think the other guy's moving. Okay, now you might think, well, since his clock is ticking slower for the moving sub here, that a person on the moving sub would be able to, you know, for example, look at clock signals coming from the other submarine and realize that his clock is the one that's ticking slowly. Okay, the problem with that argument is that when the wave is sent from submarine A and received by submarine B, uh, it's Doppler shifted. And in this case, it's Doppler shifted, uh, presumably due to the moving receiver B. But the problem, if, if you're sitting in submarine B, you would think that the Doppler shift is coming from a moving source, you know, namely submarine A. And so the Doppler shift you apply will be different than what you would apply if you thought you're the one that's moving. And it turns out that because you're going to apply a different Doppler shift, uh, you in fact would conclude that it's actually the clock on submarine A that's ticking slowly compared to your clock, which you think is stationary. So it turns out it's impossible to determine absolutely who's moving and who's stationary if you're just using wave measurements. Now if you get a chance to look at this yourself, you can go read through the explanation here, uh, go through the math, and you'll see that in fact the uh, relationship between the two measurements satisfies what's called the Lorentz transformation for time. Okay, let's look at another animation, this time velocity. And what you see here is one submarine is moving away from the other one. Uh, it's a little hard to see, but what happens at the beginning there is there's a brief delay and then each of the subs sends out a sound pulse. And what each of them is going to do is take that initial time delay, 
and then measure the time it takes for the wave to propagate down and back. And from the ratio between those two times, they're going to calculate uh, what the velocity was. And what you see is because of the time dilation, of course the moving clock ticks slower than the stationary clock, but since they both actually detected the returning pulse at the same time, they have the same relationship between the uh, propagation time of the pulse, in this case 3.2 and for the moving sub is 1.6. So each of these subs when they calculate the relative velocity, uh, they calculate that from the ratio of these two numbers and of course the ratio is the same for both so they both predict or both measure that the other sub has uh, the same velocity v. They both get the same value for their separation speed. Okay, uh, that's a topic that's not often covered in relativity books, but it is important that um, both of the subs, you know, think that the other one has the same velocity. Okay, now let's go look at some length measurement. The first thing we'll look at is measurement of length perpendicular to the direction of motion. In this case, we have a fish uh, located uh, halfway between the two submarines. And you can see for the moving submarine, here if we play it here, you'll see it's actually the same distance as the clock distance. And for the moving submarine, uh, it's also the same distance as the clock distance. From the point of view of the moving submarine, they would see the fish actually swimming backwards and they aim their clock so that it will bounce off the fish and come right back to where it started um, from their point of view, although of course from this point of view of this sub, the starting and ending points are different. Okay, so let's watch this one more time. Notice that the geometry of the measurement is the same as the geometry of the clock, so in fact both submarines measure the same distance perpendicular to the motion. Uh, so basically the, the motion doesn't change measurements that are perpendicular to the direction of motion. Alright, now let's go back and look at length measurements in the same direction as the motion. Okay, so in this animation the fish now is swimming in front of the submarine and it's keeping the same distance for both the moving sub and the stationary sub. And the stationary sub would say that that distance is one unit. Here we can watch again. Um, it takes one tick of the clock for the wave to come back. And in the case of the moving sub, it takes two ticks of his clock, which of course is four ticks of the stationary clock. But according to him, the distance is two units. It took two ticks of the clock to measure the distance to the fish. And so what we see is that, as seen by the stationary observer, the distance to the fish was one half, or one over gamma, the distance measured by the moving submarine. And we call that length contraction because the length, as seen by the stationary observer, is shorter than the length that's actually measured by the moving observer. Okay, and again if you go through the math and take account the uh, change of position, you would get the standard formula for the Lorentz transformation. Now you might wonder if it's possible to come up with a different distance measurement by measuring just the time it takes to for the wave to go from the submarine to the fish rather than doing the whole round trip. So you might imagine that you take a clock from this submarine and then move it forward and put it on the fish and then measure what time does the wave arrive at the fish. Okay, the problem with that is when you take your clock from the submarine and move it forward, you'll be now going even faster th through the water, so you'll have an even larger gamma factor and so while you're moving it forward, the time will be running slow relative to this clock. 
And so by the time you reach the fish, your time will be behind the time that you're measuring on the submarine. So that when you propagate the wave forward, it will still reach the fish at a time which is half of the round trip propagation time. So measuring things one way does not get around the uh, limitations of doing a wave measurement and you'll end up with the same result as if you did the round trip measurement. All right, let's go take a look now at how these wave measurements can be made to look like a real universe. Okay, now the question is what kind of universe would have all your measurements be made by waves? And an answer is given here. What we've done is we've taken the water and frozen it. So ice is a solid and solids can carry transverse waves which uh, have two independent polarizations just like light waves. And of course the submarine wouldn't be able to move through ice. So what we do is we take our submarine and make them out of waves rather than out of a solid. So the submarines are now made of waves. You can think of the little particles as being waves going in circles and they propagate through the ice the same way that light propagates or you know sound waves propagate through a solid. And that will give them the same relationships between their time and distance measurements as in fact what we observe in special relativity. Now some physicists might object to this kind of model of the universe because it explicitly has a medium, you know, basically the solid ice, to carry the waves and they would claim there is no such medium. There's only the vacuum. Well the problem with that argument is that the vacuum does carry waves and in fact um, behaves uh, very similarly at least to this type of uh, elastic solid. Some people would say that the ether was you know, disproven by some experiments at the end of the 19th century by Michelson and Morley uh, where they showed that the wave speed didn't seem to vary with the direction of the Earth's motion through space. And the problem with that interpretation is that they didn't consider the idea that matter itself might be waves. Um, they had only the idea that light was waves and matter was some kind of uh, particles that were just moving through space unimpeded uh, rather than you know, propagating like a wave. Of course, there's plenty of evidence that matter does in fact consist of waves, but that will be the subject of another video. So just sort of to sum up all these animations, you can get all the relationships of special relativity if matter, material objects, are made out of waves. And of course there must be special waves where the wave energy doesn't propagate, so we call those standing waves. So the model is that matter consists of standing waves, which you could think of as waves going in circles and then your clock would tick every time the wave makes a full circuit, you know, a full loop. Okay, so that's an explanation of special relativity.